Uh, my name is Andrew Busha. I'm the field director for the North Dakota AFL-CIO, and it's my pleasure to be your MC for this month's Solidarity Saturday. And we want to thank all of you for joining us this morning. Um, Solidarity Saturday is a virtual space for North Dakotans to build communities and empower and inform ad and of empowered and informed advocates so we can raise our voices and support each other and work for justice and equality. Uh, Solidarity Saturday connects people from across the state to leverage our collective power. We're excited to kick off our spring 2023 series today with Advocacy 101. Our featured speakers will cover uh, the makeup of the current legislature and our legislative process and tips and tools on how to make your voice heard. Uh, throughout the spring, we'll continue to meet on the second Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Uh, to keep you up to date and engaged on the legislative session. And a quick shout out to uh, my colleagues here uh, with the Solidarity Saturday planning crew. Uh, we have Amy Jacobson with Play Prairie Action North Dakota, myself, Andrew Bushaw with the North Dakota AFL-CIO, Carrie Brecker with Moms Demand Action, Katie Christensen, and Madison Ziegler, both with Planned Parenthood. As a friendly reminder, we want to encourage you to leave your cameras on and mute your mics. Um, be, you know, be kind to each other and make sure that we use the chat to ask questions and engage with each other during our time and together today. Next up, I'd um, like to introduce today, uh, to cover the makeup of our state legislature. I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Jessica Edlund, a longtime friend of mine and former state legislator. And she currently serves as the membership director for the North Dakota Farmers Union. Uh, Jessica, welcome. We're eager to hear your thoughts on our current legislative body. <laughs> oh, I have lots of thoughts. Just kidding. Oh, I know. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your Saturday morning with us. We're very excited that you're here. Um, my name is Jessica Edlund, and I've served in the legislature. Then I was Jessica Hake. Um, and I can go over a little bit of the landscape of the legislature. And I'd like to also welcome, uh, there's a current legislator on, I do believe. So shout out. Thank you for being here with us. Um, so in the, the legislature is made up of a House of Representatives and a Senate. There are 94 members in the House of Representatives. There's 47 senators and the lieutenant governor always serves as the president of the Senate. Um, in the House of Representatives where I served, you have to have a plurality. So if there's a tie, a bill fails if it's 47 to 47. Um, so that's just a process uh, piece. And the, the current party breakdown of the legislature is there are 125 Republicans serving in the North Dakota legislature, and there are 16 Democrats serving in the North Dakota legislature. We have 35 women uh, in the North Dakota legislature, which is 25%, just about it's 24.8% of the legislature is represented by women. The legislature meets 80 days uh, every two years, but if they do adjourn with days reserved, the governor can call them back uh, so that I have served in special sessions where the governor calls us back like a year later uh, to address issues over a two-day period um, and some of the days that are saved. Another important piece about the North Dakota legislature is every bill gets a hearing, um, whether it has to be assigned to a committee and it has to have a hearing. Uh, now, sometimes they do um, hog house is a common term that you will hear in the North Dakota legislature, where they completely change the intent of the bill and take it into an entirely different direction. Um, so that is a common practice uh, that happens uh, when they don't like bills because the process is that every bill has to be heard. They can't just bury bills. Uh, what I have heard from my work in the North Dakota Farmers Union is that the legislative, so when they write bills because our legislature serves part-time um, and they're not full-time and they don't have a lot of staff and their office is their desk on the floor, um, there is something uh, called legislative council and it's a group of uh, lawyers and people who write, help legislators write bills. And because um, they are poorly staffed, uh, or like short staffed, if you will, not poorly staffed, there's some good people that work there. Um, they 
uh, are behind in processing the bills. So they're sitting on hundreds of bills trying to get them through because they don't have enough uh, staff uh, to process all of the bills and get everything. Um, from my experience in the legislature, I will briefly say that this work of organizing and connecting with people on the ground is incredibly important. Um, I have sat on committees where we have sat through sometimes eight hours of testimony. I can think of the animal cruelty bill to be specific. And I have heard members from the majority party say, well, this was just a waste of time. I knew how I was going to vote when we started. <clears throat> so all of that work when it comes to testifying and all of those things, sometimes um, they already know how they're going to vote going into it, which is really unfortunate. So what's really important is that you connect with people on the ground, you get people in their district reaching out to them, you're um, organizing around issues, you're connecting with people um, in your communities and you're getting them to empowering them to share their story with others in their communities so that more people um, take notice of the issues and you're building a base of supporters. Um, so, so it's, uh, that's all I have uh, for the makeup of the legislature. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Jessica. Sure appreciate that. Uh, and so the next part of our uh, program here is going to be a conversation about the process. Uh, and so we're going to hear about the process of legislation and how you can get involved in it. Uh, and that's going to be Amy Jacobson, uh, our executive director of Prairie Action, and is going to uh, lead a moder lead a lead us in this next section. Uh, take it away, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. And I just want to say that it is so amazing to see so many people plugged into today's um, to today's Solidarity Saturday event. It is um, really heartwarming to know that, you know, to see everybody's faces really, and to know that we're all in this work together. And there's a lot of different things that bring us to today's space, um, different issues and different um, uh, attacks on us and different things that we're working on, but knowing that we do have shared values when it comes to um, working in, in progressive and, you know, um, issues here in the state. So thank you for being here today. Um, I also want to add that I have had a slight technical issue this morning, and so I don't have um, the ability to share with you some of the, I was going to walk through a few things um, visually with you. I will still talk with you about them, um, but I do want to make this commitment to anybody on this call. Um, I'm going to walk you through the bill, how, how basically how a bill becomes a law and how you can plug into that process. I, um, at Prairie Action, we are a communication and digital advocacy organization, um, and we are willing to offer our services with any value aligned individual um, who is looking to use their voice, like to um, find ways to submit testimony um, or to um, leverage the bill process. Um, I will be willing to sit down with you um, and talk you through how you can easily submit your testimony or even have help with drafting of it when we get to that point. So I just want you to know that um, my email will be in the chat box and um, please feel free to reach out to me at any time this legislative session. Um, we're here as a resource. Um, so I did wanna start um, with how a bill becomes a law. I think we can. Uh, we will just have some bullets on the screen here. Um, and also a caveat to know, um, this is a 101 training and there's a lot more um, in-depth things around each of these components um, and that everybody in this space comes to this space with different levels of understanding um, from folks who are just entering the process now to people who are very seasoned um, internal working in the legislature. So I want to just recognize that now and know that it is a complicated process and we're trying to make it as easy and as accessible to you as um, as we can. Um, so again, if you want to put things in the chat, feel free to pop things in as I'm talking. That might give people further guidance or ask questions, um, and we'll try to follow up with those as much as we can. 
Um, so basically, like Jessica said, the North Dakota legislature is, consists of two bodies, the House and the Senate, um, and um, bills will be originated in one body or the other. Um, so the very first thing when we're looking, and, and we are seeing this happen now, um, is that our bills are being filed. And um, there's a timeline on those bills. We're quickly coming to the end when we'll see new bills filed and being populated onto the legislative website. Um, but really, uh, a, a legislator or even um, an advocate from their community comes forward with an idea on an issue that they want to, um, that they want elevated a policy that they want addressed by the legislature. And they work with legislative council, which is a nonpartisan um, staffing, uh, legal staffing for the legislature to draft the language. They research the information, they um, draft the language, and then, and then the bill is drafted. After that, a bill um, is introduced um, so that's when we see like um, um, basically an introduction of the bill so that now that we're beginning the process, we know what the bill is and it's gonna go through the next part of this process. It's assigned a number um, for those, um, just for us to know, uh, it'll say HB and then a number that means it originated in the house and the spot and it will begin this process in the house. Um, and if you see SB, that means Senate bill, that means it originated in the Senate, it's going to begin the process there. Uh, and I can't remember if, um, if Jessica mentioned this and she likely did, but um, what we have in North Dakota because uh, is um, when a bill originates in one body, it makes it through the entire process that we'll talk about. Then we hit crossover, which means any bill that has been voted and passed in the first body will move to the second body and go through that exact same process again in that body for both. If a bill in its originating body does not pass, then that bill is dead and it will no longer con continue on the process. And I think the good news for us is that, um, um, well, I don't know, it's kind of good news. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity in that process for us as citizens, as individuals in North Dakota to engage in that process. And so while it comes at us quick and it moves very fast, there are a lot of opportunities in all of these areas. Um, so once a bill gets a number, it gets a committee assignment. Um, and that is sort of the, the corresponding House or Senate body um, committee that's um, kind of more, um, that that bill's issue falls into their purview. Um, and oh, I lost my screen. Can you all still see me? Yes. yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you. I see nothing at this point. I'm sorry, I'm having terrible technical problems. Um, so I'm just gonna keep chatting, but please, um, the committee members, if you could text me if something's going right, that would be great. Um, so once it, that bill gets into a committee, um, that's where the public hearing be, uh, public public hearings begin. And this is really where any of us can go as um, individuals in the state of North Dakota to express through testimony um, how um, we believe a bill will impact the community. Um, we can bring in um, testimony in support of the bill, in opposition of the bill, and even in um, neutral stance on the bill that just provides additional information. Again, this is a public hearing. So anybody is able to do that. There are people who are lobbyists for organizations. Um, those folks um, go, you know, have to register with the Secretary of State and they are there representing um, an organization or a business or another entity. Um, and that they often are the ones that we see at the legislature providing testimony, um, uh, but anybody can, can provide that information. And I want to just sort of highlight that you shouldn't feel like you need to be an expert in any field in order to express your views and values and how a bill is going to impact um, your, your community or your family or your life, because that's what the process is there for. And also to note that we, North Dakota likes to, you know, kind of um, say that we have a citizen-led legislature, that our, that our politicians aren't politicians, but they're just regular folks who, um, and in some ways, maybe that's true. Um, but I would like like to let you know that you are an expert in your life. You're an expert in your community. And no one at that table likely knows more than you about how something will impact you. And your voice represents thousands of other people in North Dakota. So again, feel comfortable doing that. And um, Prairie Action and all the advocacy organizations who have been a part of Solidarity Saturday are here to help you with that. So once the bill goes through the committee, uh, through the public hearing, the committee who's um, hearing the bill um, is going to make a recommendation to their body as a whole. So they're going to say that we want you to pass. We, we give it a do pass recommendation. We give it a do not pass recommendation. And so um, 
and uh in and um it's real the for the most part i would say that the larger body does take those recommendations i you know they see about hundreds maybe thousand a thousand bills um so they do rely on their colleagues in those committees to provide the recommendations they do not need to vote the way the recommendation um goes but they do um take that information because they're the ones that heard all of the testimony um, so then after the recommendation comes from the committee, um, it is placed on the calendar um, for consideration. Um, and, and then there will be a floor debate. And um, in more recent years, um, actually in both the committee hearings and in the floor debate, that has been made um, into publicly accessible information and live time streamed. So it's kind of a newer in the last couple of legislative sessions and probably COVID helped a little bit more with that is that in any of these processes, you can access it and stream it through the North Dakota State Legislative website um, and, and you can watch what's being said. It's also recorded. Um, and um, uh, uh, and it's also recorded and easily accessible to watch those videos afterwards on the website as well. Um, we had intended to walk through the website today because of technical issues, we can't, but um, it is it can be a little bit clunky, but it is a really terrific um, resource for you. Um, but again, all of the advocates and the people who you've seen at Solidarity Saturday work on that website all the time during legislative session. So I would encourage you to reach out to somebody in a value aligned organization and just ask for assistance um, if you're needing that to understand the process. Um, so after the floor debate, we'll hear folks on both sides um, coming up and then there will be, um, um, then there will be uh, the vote. Um, and then there are different things where there's, um, potential where things um, might need to go into a conference committee, which is where they kind of people kind of hammer out the difference. But um, but generally, then there will be a vote on the bill, um, and then, like I said, there would either it would either then be moved uh, after crossover to the next body, or it would likely um, at that time then be dead and not be moving forward any further. Um, let's see what else do we. Um, there are opportunities in that process, you know, that like if a vote on once there's a couple other steps that the legislature can use um, when a bill passes or fails. So when a bill, um, if a bill um, passes and the governor decides to veto it, there are things that the legislature can do to try to override a veto. Um, we see those, every, you know, every year um, opportunities for that. There are also opportunities. So if a bill passes um, and it is signed into law, um, that the citizens can refer that issue. So that means you take it and you put it in front of this uh, in, in front of the citizens for a vote. There is a process to, for that, and it is a very swift process of needing to collect signatures. Um, and submit them to the Secretary of State within a very short period of time to be able to put a bill that the legislature passed onto the ballot. Um, additionally, you'll sometimes see what um, initiated measures that come from the legislature. So if the legislature passes a bill that is a constitutional amendment, um, then that also needs to go to the citizens for a vote. Um, and so uh, there's a, so those are a couple of checks and balances that can happen. Um, after a legislative session or after a bill has become a law, uh, then signed into law. So I'm gonna do a quick check on my time here since I can't see. Um, and and uh, so that's really the skinny on how a bill becomes a law. I wanted to also show, um, talk you through a little bit about um, how you can raise your voice in any step of that process. So whether you, show up in a committee hearing in solidarity for folks who are testifying. That's always important to show. Um, you can come into the committee hearing. There is a, a piece of paper and a clipboard on the podium in that committee um, where you write your name and you can express on that form whether you're in support or opposition to a bill. And you do not need to speak, but you can be there and showing your numbers in solidarity. You can be one of the people who get up and stand and provide testimony to the legislat legislator after the hearing closes. Um, and also on the legislative website, it is made very easy to go to a committee hearing, find out what the bill that you're interested in, when it's being heard, um, what committee is being heard in. And there's even just a very easy button for you to, um, to click on to be able to submit testimony written testimony that you would just provide online. Um, and it gives a deadline, like a time and a date that it needs to be submitted by in order to be included in the packet of information that the legislators will be reviewing. Um, 
And uh, that's also a good place for folks to use it as an organizing tactic um, that I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but getting you and a few of your friends or a few of the folks that you are, are also in favor or in opposition to do that um, easy online um, testimony is always very powerful. Uh, and, um, but you just need to pay attention to the time. Sometimes people, you know, all of these bills are coming fast and furious at us right now as they're filing. People are still trying to figure out what bills mean and how they're impacting their communities. At the same time, those bills are already being heard sometimes in committee, not always, um, but we do know that that is happening. Um, if that is, if there's a bill that um, has already been heard, now you are still able to make your voice heard on that bill. Uh, at this point, the recommendation would be to either, you know, send an email um, to the committee that heard the bill and express your support or opposition to the bill with the reasons for that. Um, or um, go ahead and reach out to your own legislators because they will beginning to have to be making considerations on both on those bills. So talking to them and letting them know that you are either in support or in opposition to a bill, um, you still have time to do that um, before a vote happens. Um, and then even after a vote happens on the floor, um, if the bill is going to, to move to the next body, again, now we have that oppor opportunity to again, go through the process, be in the committee hearing, um, do the testimony and support. Um, these are all ways that we can plug in in the process itself. And I do want to just also highlight as somebody you know who, who has worked on issues that are often under attack at the state legislature that it is a cold climate um, for people who care about human rights at the North Dakota State Capitol. We are in a minority and those who are our elected friends are in a minority. Um, and so we have to be realistic um, about what we can and can't do at the legislature, but that doesn't mean we don't try. Um, and so everybody's going to have a place where they're more comfortable. Some people are going to be comfortable going into those hostile committee hearings and providing testimony. You should not feel that you need to go into a hostile committee hearing and present testimony. You can present it online. As we said, you don't even have to talk to them if you don't want to. We can be out here and the things we're going to be talking next are about the grassroots, making our voices heard and joining together out here. The more we're vocal in our communities and finding more people who share our values, the more influence we will have on the legislature legislature in the long run. Um, so while it is incredibly hostile and a lot of people are going to um, not feel really good about what's happening, um, know that the, the more we do, the more we can connect together, the more we do these Solidarity Saturdays and you reach out to the progressive organizations that share your values, the stronger we will be. Um, and we can continue to make that loud noise out here and really publicly shame these legislators who are attacking um, human rights in our state and actually leaving very important work that could be being done for the working families and the people of our state unaddressed. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that we want to continue to uphold. And so at this point, um, I'm going to pass the baton to um, Katie Christensen, who is the state director for Planned Parenthood North Central States, and Cody um, Schuler, who is the advocacy manager for the ACLU of North Dakota, to talk a little bit more about the grassroots organizing that we can do um, to come together. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, before we move to Katie and Cody, we do have a few questions in the chat. And since we do have extra time, was wondering if Amy, you'd be okay answering a few questions for us. Um, yes. Great. Um, one I see here is when a person submits testimony electronically, is your testimony distributed to the committee before the hearing? Um, that is a very good question, and it is given to the full committee for consideration. It is also um, put into like the into the uh, recording, so online you can go ahead and see what other testimony has been submitted, and that and you can read your own testimony. And I think this is really important to know. A lot of times it feels like the legislators don't read your testimony. Um, that might be the case, but it is publicly viewable information at that point in time. So that is important for you to note um, when you're creating your testimony. Um, be only as real and like personal as you are comfortable knowing that the general public could access, including the media. Um, but that can be and also be an important tool for us, for people who don't have their voices heard at the legislature um, to, uh, to be, they may say nobody came in and testified in front of me in person on this bill. Um, but if we have 
one, we have five, we have 10, we have 100 people who have written, um, that is on them. And we can let the media know that they actually did hear from a lot of people in opposition and they aren't doing their job in reading that testimony. Thank you so much, Amy. And we do have one more question, one time, time from one more question. Um, so I was wondering if you could address this one that I believe is about the hog housing we heard Jessica reference earlier. Someone said, I feel as though last session, um, bills we thought were defeated came back in the last minute. Am I accurate about this? And if so, how might that happen? Yeah, there are there are opportunities for that to happen. Um, I'm not recalling specific, I'm, I'm not in this moment able to recall specifically what happened last legislative session, um, but oftentimes we will see them come forward through amendments on other bills. Um, we will see bills completely rewritten. Um, so bills who maybe made it through the process further be rewritten in committee and um, that information like on a bill that maybe was defeated can actually just replace that. Um, so we do need to be paying attention all of the time. And that's where I would depend on the advocacy organization, the membership organizations that you belong to, um, who have maybe paid staff or at least some pretty hardcore volunteers who are really in it and being able to um, do what they can to follow that and then translate that out to their members to be able to take action on. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you for being flexible with answering questions. Um, I think now we have time to turn it over to Katie and Cody. All right, thank you. Next slide. So good morning, everyone. Uh, as Amy said, my name is Cody Schuler, uh, Advocacy Manager for North Dakota with the ACLU. And uh, this morning, as we get started, uh, this quote uh, sits on my desk. Um, well, actually, now it's on the wall, but it used to be on a plaque on my desk. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes from uh, Barack Obama, that change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time, because we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Um, this is often quoted, and if you go to the next slide, um, we actually know that that last part is uh, a quote from June Jordan uh, from a poem that she wrote uh, about advocacy in South Africa. And I uh, wanna lift that up today because it's why we're here. Um, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Anytime we say something, someone should do something about that. Someone should stand up and say something. Um, we can't just always wait for someone else to do it. Sometimes someone does stand up and we can join them, but sometimes we are the ones uh, that need to stand up. And so that's why we're here today and hoping that through this time together, we'll be able to uh, uh, help folks to feel a little bit more confident about being uh, that change, if you will, uh, in the world. So uh, Katie, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Cody. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'll just echo what my, my colleagues and my friends have said before, um, that there are a lot of different ways to get engaged. Um, and we know that people have different levels of comfort and ability when it comes to being engaged. So Cody and I are going to present a lot of different options, a lot of different ways that, that you can leverage your voice. Um, and hopefully you'll find one or two that, that are a good fit for you. So I'm going to start out here first talking a little bit about social events. These tend to be fairly informal gatherings. Um, we'll see um, some updates from what's going on in the state legislature, but there tends to be a, a lot of conversation. It often takes place at a, at a restaurant or a bar or somewhere out, out in the community. Um, as you can see on the screen right here, the North Dakota Women's Network, they host Feminist First Fridays throughout the entire state. I think there are seven or eight different locations. Um, and on the first Friday of each month, they gather and they talk about what is going on in the state, um, what are impact, what are what's happening that impacts the mission of the North Dakota Women's Network. Um, for instance, right now, the North Dakota Women's Network is working on bills related to eliminating tax on menstrual hygiene products. Um, they're following paid family leave. They're staying highly engaged with with reproductive rights. Um, ACLU, in particular, I actually attended this event um, a couple weeks back. Cheers, beers, and chats. Um, at Fargo Brewing Company. Um, those of us that were there were very engaged in conversation. ACLU right now is following a lot of bills uh, related to voting rights, but I think a couple in particular are related to censorship. And I actually saw somebody put that in the chat earlier with libraries trying to ban certain books. And the books that they're really targeting happen to be related more often than not to human sexuality. So really trying to ban information on sexual orientation, on, on gender, um, just on some really uh, 
areas that are under frequent attack here, here in the state. So we're really grateful to Cody and ACLU for keeping an eye um, on those things. Uh, next up on my, on my list here, I have town halls, webinars, and trainings. These do tend to be a little bit more structured than those social, social events. As you can see right here up on the slide, I have two different events that, um, that are our options. One of them is in person, the call to welcome town hall. This is being offered through St. John Lutheran Church in, in uh, Fargo. They're going to provide legislative session updates, crafting our stories, calls to action. And then there's another one, the ND legislative webinar that's hosted by North Dakota Native Vote. And that one is actually online. So these are ways kind of similar to what we're doing today, where you can um, learn tips and skills. You can keep up to date on the state legislature. I'd say it's a little bit more structured than than the social than the social events. Um, St. John's Lutheran Church, as far as I know, they've been pretty active in trying to protect our LGBTQ community. Um, and the North Dakota Native vote, again, is really related to how the legislative um, process operates and, and our right to vote and, and to access um, that information. Another option for getting connected is Halt the Assault. Um, and you can see this is hosted by ACLU, Prairie Action, the Wind Fund, and Planned Parenthood. This is going to be in Fargo. And we are holding this on event on what would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Um, but instead of coming together in celebration, we're actually coming together to try to halt future assaults on our reproductive rights. Um, we actually know that there is a really big, horrific abortion ban bill that is going to be heard on, on Monday, and it'll be in the Judiciary Committee. So as Amy was explaining that process earlier, this is an example here that we know halt the assault, or we know that um, the abortion bill will be in the Judiciary Committee. So that's the committee that we're really focusing on on right now. Um, if you are interested in watching that particular hearing, you can access that. You can watch it live through that legislative website. If you are interested in submitting testimony or letters to the editor, that is what we're here to help you do if you would like to be engaged um, in that bill somehow. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn it back over um, to Cody. Thanks, Katie. Uh, and thanks for lifting up our event. We hope to be having more of those. And we're also going to try and have some in Bismarck during the session. So be watching for those pints and politics activities. So uh, letters to the editor is uh, one way that you all can engage uh, your uh, the legislative process. Um, letters to the editor can be great advocacy tools. Some people will make the argument that, you know what, every all the papers are digital now. You know, there's not a lot of... Uh, um, papers laying around at coffee shops or out in public places. So do letters to the editor still work? Yes, they can still be a really effective tool. In fact, in some ways, even more so because with all the digital media, um, more letters are printed, more things actually uh, make it onto the web than would have been room for traditional paper copies. And so it's a really great opportunity uh, to be able to, um, to do that. So uh, what they can do is they can reach a large audience because uh, they're out on the internet, uh, they're on paper that again, laying around in coffee shops and those kinds of things. Oftentimes elected officials monitor those, particularly like our congressional delegation, they have staff that actually um, are combing, whether they be in the regional offices or in DC, they're looking at letters to the editor to see and keep their, their finger on the pulse of constituency. That also can happen with legislators as well um, and, uh, and, and the folks that are supporting uh, legislators. Um, then also, they can. this is a great way to draw attention to information that's not addressed in news articles. So when the newspaper says X, Y, and Z, if you feel they left out a point, it's an opportunity to point out the facts that were missed or an alternative viewpoint that wasn't represented. And then also, it can it create the impression of wide side, wide spread support or opposition to an issue. Not just the impression, it can actually just show that widespread, but it also can create the impression where you can um, get more visibility to your issue. Next slide. So when writing a letter to the editor, I think some people are a little intimidated by the process sometimes. Um, you don't need to be an English major. You don't have to have a degree in, in some fancy uh, writing, uh, creative writing course or something like that to be able to write a letter to the editor. It's super easy. Make sure that when you write it, you want to keep it short and to one subject. Don't take on all the issues you have. Um, say, I'm going to pick on one bill or I'm going to pick on this one news article that just literally was wrong. Um, so you keep it short to the point, uh, that sort of be brief, be brilliant, be gone attitude. Um, then we also want to make sure that it's legible. If you're not typing it, you know, you should type it up and send it in, that kind of thing. Most 
Most are submitted by email these days, but if you are sending it in on paper, um, especially if you're handwriting because typing isn't your thing, make sure that it's incredibly legible um, for the newspaper to be able to use. Um, don't forget the small newspapers. A lot of times we think of like, oh, we just wanna make sure and get it in the form or, or in the Tribune. Really, if you want to uh, get your the word out there, you're going to want to uh, put write to those small newspapers as well. When I was a little kid, we got the Napoleon Homestead. The Napoleon Homestead is a tiny little paper that has lots of room, and a lot of times they're looking for content. And so when you send things and you have an opportunity to get um, your viewpoints out to a different set of people uh, in a rural area. Uh, and so it can be great to not forget about those. And then uh, make sure you include your contact information. They're not going to print your address or anything like that, but they might say you're from Fargo, you're from Bismarck, you're from Beulah. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you do that. And then lastly, uh, make reference to the paper. Uh, a lot of times like that may, might not be true when you're when you're sending it to us or writing about a certain issue, but um, some phrases there that are on the screen. I strongly disagree with the author's name, their narrow view on reproductive rights and then name the op ed date so that you're responding. Um, so just really great ways to make sure that you're um, that's one of the ways your letter is going to get printed is because you've actually made reference to something in the paper as well, but you can also just write and make it general as well. So uh, Katie, back to you. Okay, so next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about digital actions. Um, this is quick, this is easy. You can do this from your home, you can do this from your phone. Um, I wanna point out that uh, Amy Jacobson at Prairie Action does an amazing job of setting up online actions for us. You can see some of these actions. There are three of them I put up here that um, she has created in the past, um, trying to uh, save the Native American history bill um, for, uh, for that information to be shared in the schools, um, protecting our LGBTQ community, um, acting on emergency paid family leave, um, and then I shared another example up here from uh, Moms Demand Action. So these are actually really quite simple and I will show you why. So typically what happens with a digital action is that when you agree to take it, when you click on it, um, you share your information and oftentimes there is already a letter that is written. Now you can use the template that is here. A lot of times you're able to personalize it and change it out if you would like. Um, but whoever sets up this digital action, they have it set up so that your information automatically goes to where it needs to go. So instead of you looking up maybe a legislator's email address or you having to draft an email on your own, you can do this and use these um, templates that are already provided for you. Um, I'm also a huge, huge fan of this tool that's available from the League of of women voters. Um, it's this outreach circle. I put the, the link up here on the top and then it's also going to be provided in the chat. Um, as you can see on here, the League of Women Voters is following different bills and then they have a lot of ways that you can take action. So you can stay up to date on the bills and you can engage them in different ways. So quick question um, for this group here. How many people knew that the, or actually know that the state of North Dakota has zero laws, zero campaign fa finance laws re uh, related to school board candidates. Um, this was something that was brand new information to me, I would say within the past year. And so one of the bills that League of Women Voters is following is, is a bill that would actually require school board candidates to submit their campaign finance reports, just like all of the other elected officials um, in our state. Um, we also see that right now that League of Women Voters is following a bill that would prohibit the use of ranked choice and approval voting in North Dakota elections. Um, as a resident of Fargo who voted to implement this new system um, at one point in time, it's really quite disappointing to see that that is now being attacked and trying to be taken away from us. Um, we also see that they're following a bill that addresses proof of citizen documentation to vote in elections. Um, so League of Women Voters, this is a really fabulous tool that they have available for, it, for us. I highly recommend it. Um, now, another thing that you can do with digital actions that's so awesome is you can share. So sharing is caring, I put up here to keep um, your friends and, and uh, your peers involved. Um, if you take a look up here, when I took that digital action, I could share it or tweet it right from the page. 
Uh, oftentimes letters to the editor that when they're posted on different social media outlets will have a button where you can share. And then we also see that the League of Women Voters right down here, there's a button where you can share this. So these are ways that whatever it is that you are approving these different actions that you are taking, you can push them out more in, into the community. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it back over to Cody. Thanks, Katie. And Katie gave me the perfect lead in to talk a little bit about social media. First of all, is social media a big waste of time or a powerful tool? Probably a little bit of both. Uh, I know sometimes I fall down the rabbit hole and waste a lot of time on social media. And then on the other hand, it can also be a really powerful tool because it's a place where you can find resources. Um, you would be surprised how many things get posted on uh, social media sites that actually can be a helpful tool. Uh, back in 2020, I had surgery right the day after George Floyd was killed. And all of this action took place that I was not able to participate in, despite one of the marches actually originating outside of my apartment building. And it was very frustrating. And so I spent a lot of time on social media and I discovered so many people across the country and around the world were, post, were putting um, toolkits, how to, how to take action. There was all sorts of really cool resources and I started saving them into a little tab so I could go back to them later. And so you'd never know what you're gonna be able to find, what kind of resources. It's also a place, just as Katie was showing you, to share a letter to the editor. So going back to writing those letters, you can get there, drop the link in or hit the share button when they're published and you're able to, uh, to get those and spread those around um, so that other people can see them. You can share articles, you can share those events, those actions, like Katie said. I want, uh, as a per sort of a personal, uh, from a personal note, um, again, going back to is, is it a waste of time? Sometimes I sit on Facebook and I'll share things and I'll just kind of get a happy button finger and I'll just share lots of stuff, right? Um, I've oftentimes thought like, oh, this is just a waste of time. Nobody's looking at it. I didn't get a lot of likes on that, whatever. And then I'll get a message from a friend who would say, Thank you for posting that. I had no idea that was going on. Or one friend of mine always says, oh, I just watch your Facebook um, for the news. I got, that's how I get all, most of my news because I just like watch that. And so that made me rethink and like, okay, it's not a waste of time for me to share things that I'm reading or looking at because it might actually help somebody else. So I just keep doing it. And if people are annoyed by that, that's on them because I'm just going to keep doing it. Uh, it's also a great place for you to research the opposition. Um, it's a way for you to, to watch. Like some people say, why do you follow Breitbart News? And I say, I follow them on Facebook because I like to see what their headlines are. I want to see how they're spinning the news. It's not because I like them. It's because I want to, you know, watch them. Uh, I was, uh, I liked an unpopular politician one time and a friend said, why are you, why do you like that person? I said, I don't like them. I'm watching to see what they post. Uh, and so it's, I think it's really important. Another thing that I did, and, and this is maybe a little too far to, uh, to one direction, but when, uh, again, during the pandemic, um, you know, I, I was very concerned about what was happening in the anti-vaxxer movement. I actually joined an anti-vaxxer group and stayed very quiet in there just to watch to see what they were saying. It really helped me understand who they were until I finally got kicked out. Uh, but it was a great way for me to see what was going on. Um, and then uh, also there are groups for you to join that support things. A lot of times different, a protest or a rally or different things will come up. And the only way I knew about them is because I'm in certain groups where people will share those events or share the information. Or if I heard about something and I say, hey, I heard this is going on. Does anybody know about this? I can post it in the group. So find those, those affinity groups and those like-minded groups. And then also lastly, messaging. Just a really great way. You know, you don't, you don't know how to get a hold. You don't have an email or a phone number of someone you want to reach out, you want to learn more about something, you can message them on social media and, and maybe be able to get in, get a hold of somebody. And so social media can really play an important part of, um, of just being active and making your voice heard, but also being informed and informing other people. Katie. Thank you, Cody. All right, so um, I'm going to highlight two more other ways to get involved here before we close out for today. Another really great way to get involved and to really understand the process is to attend a lobby day event. Now, these do tend to be more heavily involved. They tend to be one to two day events. Um, so we'll post in the chat, chat and I'll share up here um, the lobby day. There's one being held by ND United. Um, they represent all of our public employees in, in the state. They're heavily involved, especially when it comes to our public schools, both our public schools and our public higher ed institutions. I know right now they're really working hard to follow um, some of the concerns related to pensions, a lot of funding for our schools, um, protecting our, our teachers and our schools in teaching content that is, is relevant and necessary in, in today's schools. Um, 
I attended my first Lobby Day We Rise actually quite a few years ago. And when you attend events like this, they, they really lead you through the legislative process, but you get to physically be there in the Capitol. You get to sit in on hearings um, and see what those committee meetings look like. You get to listen to how the, those lawmakers interact with each other. Um, you get to sit in um, up in the balcony during the floor sessions and you can watch how that process works. And if you're really lucky, you might even get to sit on the floor with uh, one of your favorite legislators. Um, so I did actually get to spend a little time um, during that session sitting next to Josh Gauthier. Um, so this is, a, this is a way that you can really get engaged and see how the process works live in person right in front of you. So we'll get those links in the chat. Um, Lobby Day with ND United and then there's another Lobby Day with the North Dakota Women's Network. Um, there will likely be other ones available uh, as the as the session continues. Um, and then the final event that I wanted to share with you is there will likely pop up different protests and rallies throughout the session. Um, as the session goes along, we, we usually start to see what are those bills that are really rising to the top that are going to be the most harmful or the most hurtful to our communities and, and what can we do? How can we come together to really show our solidarity and, and our opposition um, to these. So um, when we do have these protests and rallies, we tend to have some pretty amazing speakers, experts um, within the field, individuals who will be most impacted by what's going on. So I shared a, a picture here. Um, these are high school students that were marching on the Capitol um, protesting the, um, it was a bill that was targeting transgender athletes. And we know that that eventually ended up being vetoed uh, by the governor um, because of so much pushback and so much um, outrage towards that. And then there's another picture here. This was from from um, a March for Our Lives rally that was hosted by Moms Demand Action um, to try to bring awareness to um, gun violence with, within, our, within our communities. Um, so those are the last two, um, uh, this, these are the last two ways I was gonna show to get involved. I do wanna um, acknowledge that we know that there are a lot of bills coming out, still coming out right now, and many of them are, are really harmful, they're really extreme, they're not what we wanna see happening. So if you continue with us on February 11th, the second Saturday of each month as we go through the session, we're gonna dive more specifically into specific bills. We know that there are some pretty outrageous attacks, especially on the LGBTQ community, especially on reproductive rights. Um, we're very concerned about workers' rights and labor's right, uh, labor uh, as we move through this session too. So um, please follow us on Facebook, Solidarity Saturdays. We'll be posting updates there. You can also follow Prairie Action ND. I would highly, highly recommend signing up for the Prairie Briefings um, from Prairie Action. These come out daily and they're awesome little kind of glimpses in, into what we're seeing in, in the state. Um, that's all we got for you. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and post them in the chat. And we really look forward to seeing you again next month on February 11th. If you want to get involved in any of this, these events that we've suggested so far, please, please, please reach out to us and we would love to, to get you engaged.